start with some water here. Um, I don't know who that cur the colonel's talking about, so I'd love to meet that person. I, I, uh, I hope to, I aspire to be, uh, to be able to achieve such great things. I'm here tonight to share with you a vision. A vision that involves a travel industry, but it also is a vision that involves each of you as a traveler. Raise your hand. It's a little late, so I'm going to wake up everybody. Raise your hand if you have a trip planned to go see nature at some point in the next year. It's awesome. Because my organization, actually, I'm going to tell you, sometimes is of two minds about tourism. Tourism, we've all seen, can be a massive threat, and tourism can also increase one's carbon footprint. But I'm here to tell you today that tourism, if done right, is the absolute solution for wildlife in a warmer, more crowded world, but also particularly for tigers. So we're, I'm going to try to go quickly through some of these slides. You've heard far more eloquent people talk about the value of nature-based tourism. But I want to make it really, really visceral and very obvious. Before I start, though, I want to just take a moment of silence for the people of Nepal. I was there six days before the earthquake, working on tiger conservation. It is a place that is full of some of the bravest people who have been through incredible difficulties over the past several decades and now have suffered another one. And so I hope that one of those places that you've got on your bucket list is Nepal. Go back to Nepal. Nepal is in shape. Nepal needs you, and Nepal needs you to choose nature-based tourism that supports communities, the kind of tourism that Colin was talking about. Nepal needs you now more than ever, because what Nepal has done, this little country in the Himalaya, has done something extraordinary. It has done what no other country on the face of the planet has been able to do. It has had a third year of zero poaching. No tigers, no rhinos, no elephants, and it has plenty of them. Zero poaching. You only get to, do, you only get to zero poaching when you put your heart and soul into those animals and you realize that they are worth more alive than dead. So I stand completely here, completely humbled by what Nepal has been able to achieve, but it's also something that can be replicated around the world, and one of the ways it can be is through conservation travel. Now, as the colonel said, I'm a bird biologist by training. I must have been a really shitty scientist because now all I do is talk to people about other people's science. But I will tell you, I'm also not an economist, but I do understand supply and demand. Nature gives us this absolutely extraordinary supply. Extraordinary. It gives us so many resources, not just the air we breathe and the food we eat and the water we drink, but it also gives us these incredible places to go. It supports our demand to explore them, to swim in its waters, to hike on its mountains, and to view incredible wildlife. But that there are other demands on that supply, and some of those demands are not so sustainable. And we know that those demands are quickly outstripping supply. Again, no, no economist here, but if I can tell you that this is not smart. Now, we all know that. We hear that all the time. The conservationist crying wolf. The environmentalist running around screaming about how the world's going to hell in a handbasket. Well, it is, actually. And this is not, the, the, uh, it's not uh, hyperbole anymore. Because that supply is quickly dwindling, and before you know it, you will not be able to go to these places to see wild tigers. And that's a guarantee. The Earth is an incredibly complicated place. When you look at the whole world, the forest, the oceans, the rivers, the climate, it is all connected. And it all supports this glorious array of life and us at the same time. And we are slowly, inexorably, destroying what is our home. And if we don't take care, 
The only nature we're going to know in this world, we're going to visit like museums. It's going to be people standing in line to pay some money to enter a park and see what the world used to look like. Now, I'm not crying wolf, and I am a scientist by training, so all of this kind of information, these bad news stories you hear a lot of, they are based on the facts. The World Wildlife Fund, with partners, produces every year, or excuse me, every two years, a report called the Living Planet Report. And what that report is designed to do is actually take the very best science from around the world and put it into terms that we can all understand. So this is a graph, if you think about what the Earth can sustain, is this green line. There's one Earth that can sustain, when you look at the use, the resource use that we have today, which is this red line, you'll see our resource use has outstripped what the Earth can replenish. So really, put even in more simple terms, because I have a very simple mind, we're using one and a half Earths. Now raise your hand if you think that's smart. And it gets a little bit worse. And I'm, I'm saying this because I want you as a traveler, I want you as an as a environmentalist, and you as a travel company to realize that, that we are at the 11th hour, and it's time for us all to get involved. Because today, since the year I was born, in 1970, we've lost more than half of wildlife. More than half. Obviously, that situation is much worse in certain places where we've lost all of a species. But we've lost more than half of wildlife on this planet since the year I was born. That's personal. And today, the reason is because wildlife is simply not worth more alive than dead. Colin talked to you about the, the, the price per kilo of rhino horn. That's pretty tough to compete with. Wildlife is not worth more alive than dead. But I'm here to tell you that there, are, there is hope, and tourism and travel is a way to transform that. Tourism and travel is one of the very, very few ways that we turn wildlife into something of value, where we elevate wildlife's worth. Now, you've heard of that happening in places like Quito, Ecuador, where people are paying to protect the watershed that provides the water for that city. The same things happen in New York City. The Adirondack Park was established to protect the watershed of New York City. So there was value in keeping that forest intact. But there are very few ways to protect wildlife and make it worth more alive than dead than travel. And so that is why I'm here to tell you right now Ecotourism is dead. Ecotourism is dead. The ecotourism that we have pushed out there for so long has now become such a watered-down term, expecting that somebody else, some NGO or some government, is going to keep the resource there. It's become a watered-down term, and it is now being replaced, and it's going to be replaced because it has to be replaced by conservation travel. And that's what Colin and Jules have been talking to you about tonight. Conservation travel, it's sustainable travel, so responsible travel. But it's sustainable travel that, that connects the traveler, that person, in their, when they're at their most vulnerable, most inspirable, connects them with nature and directly supports its protection. Does not assume that somebody else is going to take care of it while the companies or, a proper, pros, prosper and the travelers benefit. It gets engaged itself. And there are three ways that that happens. Again, I have a very simple, small mind, so there's, I have to have alliterations. There are three ways to remember that, and they're the three eyes. And I want you as a travel operator to take these three eyes home, and I want you as a traveler to ask the company you're going to travel with, what are you doing to incentivize conservation, to influence the people who are going to make decisions about the future of nature, whether they're a government or a local community, and what are you doing to invest in that resource, keeping it there for the long haul. Three eyes. We're going to talk about those, and I'm going to take just a slightly deeper dive around incentivize, because that is really what matters. We're trying to encourage the people who are making these decisions, often local communities who have to live with wildlife, that that wildlife is worth more alive than dead. So Colin talked to you about this, this country, which I know you, you all can pronounce it, but being from America, most people don't even know how to pronounce it, Namibia, and people couldn't even tell you where it is. Today, it's actually now 
one of the top 10 destinations worldwide, whether you look at the Guardian's ranking or the New York Times ranking. Why? Because it is the greatest wildlife recovery story ever told, and that's because, in large part, because of people like Colin and Wilderness Safaris, because of brave Namibians who saw that they could benefit from their wildlife instead of destroying it. And I'm going to shut up because you don't want to hear some guy from the States, some yank talking about all, these, all this environmental stuff. I want you to hear from a goat herder, someone who I've gotten to know quite well. You see the lions there on the mountain. It's very, very dangerous. We have a big group of people here. Sisters, brothers. We are one family. I love my place. I have a lot of livestock. It's a lot of work. You must take him out, care for him and bring him back. Put him in the crawl in the night. I have cows who was lost by lions. There was two of them. They come to the house, take the cow, and then it's gone. My mother was scared. She's telling me, oh, oh, a new problem. The lions are going anywhere and you cannot see him. You cannot know where it is. And then I decide the best thing is I will kill those lions. So it's really hard to live with wildlife. And I say that as somebody who comes from a culture where we extirpated almost all of our bison. It's really hard to live with wildlife when the wolves have all almost disappeared in Europe. But we also know it can come back, and Namibia shows us how how you recover wildlife. It's an incredible success story, and tourism has driven it. But it was not always a rosy story. Colin was, told you about how it's changed and shifted. It, it came from a very, very dark place, a dark place where apartheid was rampant as a policy, where wildlife were killed during decades of civil war, where wildlife was... was not worth more life than dead to local communities because they got no benefit from it. These were people who were moved from one place to some of the most deserted areas in southern Africa and left to fend for themselves. So after 23 years of civil war, a new country emerged, Namibia. And because of visionaries, people like Colin, people like Chris Weaver from the World Wildlife Fund, they said, this is an opportunity for this country. This is an opportunity. And, and began speaking with local people, with environmental leaders there who said, you know what, let's do something different. Let's create a country where people can actually own the wildlife. I hate to break it to you, but none of you own the wildlife in the United Kingdom. You don't own the wildlife that might the, run across the road. I don't own the wildlife in the United States. The government, the state owns that. What Namibia said was, if you... Conserva you, you communities come together and you organize yourself and you do it in a responsible way and you manage your wildlife, you can own it. You can have the benefit. And that changed everything. What were formed were these conservancies, groups of communities that organize themselves. They have a constitution. They have leadership. They have a management plan for their wildlife. And what happened was they did that and they did it in partnership with responsible travel companies as well, like Wilderness Safaris, who said, you know what? You're going to get not just employment, you're going to get a share of my profits. And you know what else? Beyond that, 30 years from now, you're going to own this lodge. Because I have profited enough from this. You are going to own it. 
That changed everything. It changed everything. And what it did was help a people to come out of a dark period into one of the greatest wildlife recovery stories ever told. Now, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy, and and that's what WWF has been doing for 20 years, has been building the capacity of each and every one of these conservancies. And now looking forward and saying, how do we sustain them financially in perpetuity? Because what they've done is extraordinary. But it wasn't easy, particularly when you work with some local people where you need to count wildlife, you need to understand the ecology of these species to know how they're going to reproduce. But the way that you've counted historically in your culture is one, two, three, four, five, another five, and many fives. So how do you translate complex ecology into something that that these local community members can work with and manage their wildlife? We did it, and it's worked, and it's extraordinary. 44% of Namibia is now conserved. United States, 12%. That's all we got, 12%. That's including protected areas and private lands. This is 44% of Namibia is conserved through national parks and through these conservancies. One of the things, this is a similar map to what Colin showed you, one of the things I want you to notice is that, if I can get the laser here, the pink here, or this this sort of reddish color, are the national parks. Etosha National Park is pretty famous, Skeleton Coast. What these conservancies do, these conservancies in yellow, and they're spreading. In fact, I've got a map on here that says 79 conservancies in Namibia. It's now 83. It changes almost every quarter because more and more people want to benefit from their wildlife. What it's doing is connecting those parks. Because one of the things that we forgot when we started trying to conserve wildlife was that wildlife needs the freedom to roam. And otherwise, it's, it's ultimately going to decline. Conservancies are doing that, and they're doing it in an extraordinary way. And why are they doing that? Because now, because of both trophy hunting and tourism, have made, placed a value on healthy populations of species. They've made wildlife worth more alive than dead. Wilderness safaris and Collins Vision made wildlife worth more alive than dead to those communities. So now, if you add any new species or restore a species onto your conservancy... It's worth $2,100 per year. $2,100 to a community, as Colin said, that some of these people have never had a job. They were subsistence farmers. If you've got the big five, it's $22,000, or excuse me, $22,000 per year. But then if you add in black rhino, it's $111,000 of income on average that comes into your community. Now we're starting to compete. Now we're starting to compete with the illegal trade in rhino horn. All because of tourism. And because, not just because of Colin and the brave people of Namibia and positive forward-looking priorities, but because travelers like you also said, I want to do a trip that goes to see this wildlife in a way that benefits the communities as well. These numbers say it all. And so what's happening now is some of that income's coming from one conservancy selling off wildlife to another conservancy. So they're doing these tra- these, this um, relocation of antelope and rhinos everywhere. Now lions, you heard about the plight of lions, and Namibia was no different. There were only 20 lions in 1995. Today there's over 150. Namibia is the only p- country in Africa where lion- the lion population is on the increase. Every single other country in Africa, they are rapidly declining. Why? Because wildlife is worth more alive than dead. You can put up with a lion eating one of your goats because people are paying to come see that lion. Same with mountain zebra. There were less than 1,000. Now there are 27,000. Black rhino was almost extinct. And as you know, it's been taking it on the chin across all of Africa And now the largest concentration of free-roaming rhino in in Africa, in the world, is in Namibia. Now, we can't rest on our laurels, as Colin said. There has been an increase in poaching in Namibia, but it has been held off, both of elephants and rhinos, because when you kill a rhino or an elephant in your your communal conservancy, when somebody kills my, my rhino, it's like I walked into your back garden and killed your dog. 
that animal belongs to you and you're not going to stand for it. And so within, typically, historically, within 24 hours, a poacher has been nabbed because of people t- finding out there was a stranger in the community. We saw these, these footprints. They shouldn't have been here. There was a poaching incident. They are part of the solution. It's not just up to the government. And so now those black rhinos are not too happy because they're being transported like this, but they're being actually sent from one place to another. They're expanding their populations across Namibia. This is just incredible. This doesn't hap- hasn't happened anywhere else in the world. And people's lives are, they recognize that their lives are being transformed because there's a direct tie to their managing their wildlife responsibly. And this is the kicker. This is what I really love. And I'm an ecologist, not a social scientist. There is a lower rate of HIV infection inside of a conservancy than outside. So if you're a member of a communal conservancy, benefiting from your wildlife, making a profit that increases your education, it empowers women, it puts health clinics into your community, and now there's a lower rate of HIV infection because of wildlife conservation. That's that's an interesting um, conversation starter. And it's pretty amazing. Namibia said five simple words. And they're five words that we have had a very hard time, most of us in the Western world, saying, we will live with wildlife, and tourism has made it all possible. So let's just hear one more time from Yonke. For your community, there's a lot of benefits you have now. As I see now, my children who are growing have the right to see an elephant near his house, a right to see the orchids here, springboks here, a rhino, the lions near. Those things is for your spirit a very good thing. Now, I didn't think it's a good thing to shoot all those animals because if all of us decide like that, what will be at the end of the day? You can have income from your wildlife as you have income from your livestock. The best thing is let him work for you and make a life out of it. There's no fear in that predator's life. That's the same feeling I have. Now I will act like him without fear. So that is a story that can be replicated worldwide if we demand conservation travel. So conservation travel is about incentivizing conservation. It's also about influencing the traveler themselves. How many of you have been on a trip where you saw some cool wildlife or it was a great hike, but you walked away and it was a distant memory? You weren't still engaged, you didn't get engaged in a, in a conservation organization or in a campaign to protect the same wildlife you just saw. That's the fault of the, traveler, of the travel industry. And I'm looking at every one of our operators in the eye. We can do more to, in, to influence the traveler, to give them, at, at a point when they are at their most inspirable, to give them something to do. Because people will do it. We are just leaving that opportunity we're making it a missed opportunity. And so one way to do that, Natural Habitat Adventures, as a partner of WWF, does this in spades. They don't hit you over the head with a conservation message, but every single thing you get, your pre-departure briefing that tells you what to pack, down to the guides that are on your trip, they are all trained to make you an inspired conservationist. That's important. That's reaching to the unconverted instead of preaching to the converted. It's bringing people in to care about these issues. It also means that the travel industry, we, un- we underestimate how powerful the travel industry is. For many, many economies, whether you're looking at Montenegro or Myanmar, tourism, there's a ministry of tourism. Why? Because it's economically important. They're listening to the travel industry. The travel industry should have influence. This is Uh, President Calderon from Mexico meeting with the head of the Adventure Travel Trade Association. That 
meeting created policy change that supported community-based conservation in Mexico. Take the opportunity. The third I is invest. Investing in protecting the very resource that you travel to or that you bring people to see. How many people in this room have a home insurance policy? Come on, folks. You're going to let your house burn down? You don't have a home insurance policy? I think most people have an insurance policy, right? Or if you own a business, you have some insurance policies. Sometimes, how many people have been on a trip and you've taken out travel insurance in case something goes wrong? You have to cancel. This is no different. This is your travel insurance. Protecting the very places that protect this industry and protect your vacation, protect your holiday. It's time for us to do more. Now, the margins in the travel industry are really small. They're small. No one's expecting a million dollars to come out of a company. Or even for some companies, even a thousand dollars. But there are in creative ways to have the traveler and the company itself to protect these resources. Like working with communities in the quarters in Nepal to give tigers the freedom to roam. Because as you heard from Jules, they, they love to reproduce, but then where do they go? They have to have safe passage to get to the next park. That's actually a really cool insurance policy if you're a tour operator. You're creating the next product to take people to. You're taking a new national park where people haven't gone. So that's a way to invest. And I'm going to conclude tonight by telling you that if you care about tigers, you the traveler, if you care about tigers, you the tour operator, then there is one path forward. We know how to save tigers. And we've put that knowledge into an initiative that is the boldest species recovery story for a single species ever attempted in the history of man. And that is T times two, doubling the number of tigers in the wild by the next Chinese year of the tiger. So since 1970, we've seen a massive decline in tigers. Actually, at the turn of the century, there were 100,000 tigers. And now there are about 3,200 was the last full estimate. I'm going to give you guys a little bit of like, secret information. It's, uh, our efforts are working. There's about 3,674 is the estimate right now. We're turning the corner. Russia next week is going to be announcing its tiger numbers, and we expect them to be better. So we know how to turn this around, but it takes you. What we've, this, what we've said is that we have got to address this loss of tigers, and we have to play defense, protecting them in their, in their landscapes, and we have to play offense by making them matter to people around the world, and particularly people in Asia in the tiger range states. So this is where all the world's tigers live. They live in this limited area up into the Russian Far East. And more people live inside that circle than live outside that circle on this planet. So as Colin and Jules said, we have to incorporate people into this equation as well and make tigers pay for themselves. And they can. Because this is what we're up against. So that's in part what T times two is about. Doubling the number of tigers. We are, we are here when this initiative got launched. 2009 was the last Chinese Year of the Tiger. Why am I so fixated on the Chinese Year of the Tiger? Anyone? Raise your hand. Come on, it's late. I'm trying to keep you awake. Why would I be fixated on the Chinese Year of the Tiger? Because China has been one of the greatest consumers of tiger parts. Tiger rugs, tiger bone wine, it goes on and on and on. And it was pivotal to actually include China in this. And so in 2009, we started this campaign, and up until 2022. So we've got those years to turn this around. Because if we can't turn tigers, the most charismatic animal on the planet, you pull any child in any Western country, and they will say it's one of their favorite animals. If we can't do that, if we can't save the tiger, quite honestly, I'm ready to move to another planet. Um, it started in 2009 in St. Petersburg. This is the, the Kremlin, a big campaign, and it involved Putin. So we went to the highest levels in these tiger range states and said, 
I mean, you may vilify Putin, but I tell you, he's a, he loves his tiger, so given that. He stood up and said, we're going to make a difference on these tigers. And there we launched this strategy, which is three, a threefold process. Number one, you heard, we have to prote- protect and connect. We have to protect their habitats and connect them with corridors. We have to protect their prey because tigers need a lot of food, which is actually one of the biggest limiting factors for tigers to recover. It's just not having enough to eat because the prey gets hunted out. So we've got to protect and connect them. We've got to terminate this trade. And we're, getting, we're making progress on that. But you can still go into markets at the border of, of Myanmar and China. Walk in right now and there's, there's a tiger carcass sitting inside of a big aquarium. And you just drain off your tiger bone wine. And, there, and it's very well documented. It's just that there's not enough pressure to, to close down these, these conduits where the, the flood of tiger parts are moving through to China. But third, and one thing that makes this very different than the typical campaign, is that we're looking at how to make this permanent. We're making 6,600 6, tigers the next new baseline, the new normal. Now, how do you do that without continuing to go to you and ask you for more money. That's what environmentalists do all the time. Because the problems never seem to end and we never seem to close a deal. We never seem to to end it. But what we're doing is looking at building the political will, the sustainable financing, the public support, and making sure that 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 new number is permanent. So we've also identified the key landscapes. Now tigers occur in more places than this. But these are the places where you get the highest return on investment. I'll show you another map in a second that's updated. But these are the places where you can more, most readily double the number of tigers and go well beyond that. A large part of it also means getting to the zero approaching that I talked to you about with looking at Nepal. We know how to do it. Nepal has now invited all the tiger range states. They've, they were there in February and started learning from little old Nepal. Nepal was teaching all of these governments, how to get to zero poaching. And we're making great progress. We've got to break the chain, these trade chains that are, or otherwise we will always be playing defense. And finally, we have to get to permanence. We have to make this matter. We've engaged Leo DiCaprio as a key champion of this Tea Times 2 campaign, putting political pressure in places where there's, we're really weak, like in, in Malaysia, putting, directly putting political pressure on these people, shining a light on what they're doing or not doing to save tigers. That creates this political will and starts to change policies, even sustainable funding from a government so that we're not always paying, you know, asking for another dollar with our hands out. And making tigers matter, making it matter to local people, as we said, through tourism, through those benefits, but also making them matter to a country as part of your identity and your pride. And so now I'm happy to say that since 2009, since we started tracking how tigers are doing, we're either stable or increasing their populations in in nine of the 13 key landscapes. Some of those other landscapes are places where we're going to restore tigers. We're bringing tigers back into Cambodia, where they've been extirpated. Part of that, part of the wait to get there is to get the prey populations back up, but they're gonna be back in Cambodia in the next five to seven years. We're bringing them back to Kazakhstan. Do you know that tigers were once in Kazakhstan? Putin is all over this. He's supporting this with with his neighboring country. And we're going to bring tigers back to Kazakhstan. So we've got some bold initiatives, but we've also got securing the core of these key landscapes. There are some laggards, and we've got a lot of work to do. Indonesia where there are several key tiger landscapes, those tigers are in deep trouble. I I could talk to you afterwards about why, but they're in deep trouble. Same with Malaysia. Malaysia has actually got quite a bit of money to put into conservation, but there are a number of political challenges, and quite frankly, not the political pressure that needs to happen enough to turn this around. So we've got more work to do. But we, and we can't wait until 2022. You can't wake up in 2021 and say, oh, we got that goal coming up next year. We better double down and raise some money. Tigers need time to recover. 
And so we've got to push hard, and we need to push now. And it's going to take all of us. WWF cannot do it. Not alone. These governments cannot do it. Not alone. It's going to take you. It's going to take the tourism industry. It's going to take the traveler. And that is the only way we're going to make tigers worth more alive than dead. And so partly what I ask of you tonight is to think about your business or your consumer demand to be, tar- to be investing in T times two. Help us double the number of tigers in the wild. We've got the plan. We need to put the resources into it, and we need to make your voice heard. We, we, there are models like this, such as in the outdoor industry in the United States, where these companies, some of which you might recognize, um, are putting money in to save the places where people go to recreate in the United States. Why aren't we doing that as a travel industry? Why? We have to. And that is the only way that we're going to be able to have a future with tigers in it. So I ask tonight that we all work with our hearts, our minds, and our pocketbooks to double down to double the number of wild tigers. And my, my last question is, are you in? Thank you.